This is Kick-Ass Politics. I'm Ben Mathis. If you're listening for the first time, this is a preview station for Kick-Ass Politics, where I put up a few sample episodes for you to check out. I hope you enjoy this episode, and if you like it, then I encourage you to go to our main program at Kick-Ass Politics and subscribe to the show. There are a lot more episodes there. Just search for Kick-Ass Politics on iTunes, or if you go to the information page for this episode on iTunes, there's a link right there to subscribe to the main show. Also, feel free to check out our webpage at kickasspolitics.com, where you'll find show notes, book recommendations, and all kinds of extras. I'm Ben Mathis, and I hope you enjoy this preview of Kick-Ass Politics. Kick-Ass Politics is brought to you by Fiverr. You've heard me rave about Fiverr before. Fiverr is the world's largest online marketplace for services with over 100,000 categories all offered for a fixed base price of just $5. Logo design, business consulting, marketing, business cards, stationery, web design, translation, transcription, proofreading, legal consulting, and just about any other service you can imagine all offered at a base price of just $5. And right now, when you go to kickasspolitics.com and click on the Fiverr ad on our sponsor page, you'll be showing our sponsor that you support the show and you'll get some great offers on services tailored to your needs. Whatever you need done, find it on Fiverr. Hollywood to Washington, it's time for Kick-Ass Politics. And now here's your host, Ben Mathis. Hi folks, in the last episode, we talked about the living nightmare that is civil asset forfeiture. It's a little known but widely abused policy that allows the feds and local law enforcement to seize anything from cash in your wallet to your car or even your home or your business, even without ever charging you with a crime. All they have to do is say that they suspect that those assets were somehow involved in a crime, and then you have to spend a fortune on lawyers' fees and go to court just to get your own property back. Well, I've got news for you, folks. Believe it or not, it can even get much worse. Just ask Terry Deco. He's an immigrant who fled Saddam Hussein's Iraq 35 years ago to escape religious persecution as a Christian. He came to America and ran a grocery store in Fraser, Michigan, and for 35 years, Terry believed that he was living the American dream until one day the IRS showed up and tried to take away everything he had worked so hard for. I've been here working in this grocery store 35 years. I was sitting in my desk and two people knocked in my daughter's office. One of them showed me the badge. I said, what can I do for you, ma'am? He said, well, we just acceded your money from the bank. I said, what do you mean you eat my money from the bank? He said, we took all the money you have in the bank. We took it. We took it off. Your account now shows zero, zero. And the secretary was by the computer. I said, Sima, look at our account. She looked at the account and she said, boss, we have zero, zero, zero in our account. I said, God, well, how you can do that? Over $35,000 vanished from Terry Deco's account just like that. Terry had run into a particularly egregious area of civil asset forfeiture in which the feds and the IRS are cleaning out the bank accounts of innocent Americans simply on the grounds that the account holders have made too many cash deposits under $10,000. An everyday practice for hundreds of thousands of small business owners that's perfectly legal. For Terry Deco, it was the beginning of a nightmare that lasted nearly a year. I said, ma'am, how we can do that? Money is not belong to us. These monies belong to suppliers. We had checks given away to the supplier of this. He said, we don't care. Do whatever you want to do. This is my card. He left, and I called a lawyer. And my lawyer mailed them letters. They said, in 30 days, we should give the money back. So we waited 30 days, no answer. And after that, he said, we'll give you 20% back. We call it even, we close the case. 
and you don't have nothing to do with us. I said, no, 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 no. It's my money. How are we going to negotiate with that? We live in a free country. I said, I will fight it till the last drop I have. Terry Deco turned to the Institute for Justice, a nonprofit civil liberties law firm dedicated to protecting private property, economic liberty, freedom of speech, and school choice. The Institute has represented a number of forfeiture victims pro bono. Here's Robert Johnson, an attorney with the Institute. There's a federal law that requires banks to report cash transactions over $10,000, and it makes it a crime called structuring to deposit money in the bank in amounts under $10,000 in order to evade that reporting requirement. Terry had his money taken by the government because he was depositing money in the bank in amounts under $10,000. And the government looked at that practice and based solely on the fact that he was depositing money in these amounts, it decided that he was structuring. As Rob Johnson explains, there are plenty of legitimate reasons for individuals and business owners to make regular cash deposits under $10,000. But the feds have very little interest in discerning between legitimate transactions and actual structuring. In Terry's case, he actually did have an insurance policy that only covered up to $10,000 of cash. And so whenever he got up to around $10,000 of cash on the premises, he would take it to the bank and he would deposit it. The government made no effort to determine if there was some legitimate business justification for what he was doing, which there was. Uh, And it took his entire bank account and then it held it and it forced him to uh, litigate to get the property back. Terry eventually got his money back, but the whole ordeal took its toll. After 35 years, Terry Deco gave up and closed his market for good. What happened? I've been here operating this business for 34 years, 35 years. Never happened anything like that. Coke, the, even the bread man refused me for credit. They don't want to give me any, any merchandise like they used to be week to week. We are business people. We're doing good for country. We hire people. I used to love this job. Now I'm telling you, I just want to give the key away and leave. They make me hate it now. But if you think that's bad, wait till you hear of the story of Mitch, Richard, and Jeffrey Hirsch, three brothers from Long Island, New York, whose company, Bi-County Distributors, got slapped with a civil asset forfeiture. Rob Johnson of the Institute for Justice was their lawyer. The Hirsch brothers had their entire bank account seized, almost half a million dollars. And then the government held their account for over two and a half years and didn't even give them a hearing before a judge at which they could present evidence of their own innocence. And in the meantime, the government would come up to them with what are, um, you know, technically might be called settlement offers, but some would characterize as extortion, where the government would say, we'd be happy to give you half of the money back as long as you agreed not to fight us and to let us keep the rest of it. And in that time, they never filed a forfeiture action. Jeff was, he's just an ordinary businessman who had done nothing wrong other than deposit his own hard-earned cash in the bank. And they realized that Jeff wasn't going to roll over, that he was going to fight, and that he was going to make them take their case to court. And I think they realized at the end of the day, they either could not prove their case or did not want to bring their case before a judge. And so after almost three years, of holding the property, they turned around and they gave it all back, and they walked away. And just to be clear, it's not against the law to make cash deposits under $10,000. In fact, millions of Americans do it all the time. As Rob Johnson points out, there are plenty of legitimate reasons to make these types of cash deposits that have nothing to do with structuring or evading taxes. People have all kinds of reasons to deposit money in the bank. Uh, in amounts under $10,000. For instance, they may have an insurance policy that only covers up to $10,000 in cash. Or in many instances, bank tellers actually tell customers that they will avoid red tape and simply make life easier for the bank and for everybody involved if they limit the size of their deposits. The Hirsch brothers had several banks over the years close their accounts because they were depositing cash in amounts over $10,000. Banks don't like filling out the reports that they're required to submit to the government because it's just a lot of paperwork for them. 
So the Hirsch brothers, actually, their accountant advised them that if they kept their deposits under 10000 that would make it less likely that banks would close their accounts in the future. And if you think these are isolated incidents, think again. Structuring cases have become a cash cow for the IRS. Over a period of seven years, between 2005 and 2012, the government seized uh, $242 million under the structuring laws. Um, in 2012 alone, there were 639 seizures. So we are talking about a large number of cases. I asked Rob Johnson how a structuring victim is supposed to hire a lawyer and mount an effective defense when all of his resources have been taken away. That is absolutely an issue in structuring cases. People have their money is taken and then they have to go out and they have to get a lawyer in order to fight to get the money back. Not just that, but it can cost much more to litigate a structuring case than the amount of property that may actually be at issue. Half of all seizures are under about $30,000, you know, which is a lot of money. But when you're talking about the hourly rate of an attorney, to actually litigate an entire structuring case all the way from start to finish would be much more than that. So at that point, what people end up doing is they end up settling with the government and agreeing to forfeit half or even more of the property because they simply can't afford to fight. And this is something they do on purpose. The government's policy manual states that it's the government's policy to settle as many of these cases out of court as possible. And so they will take the money and then they will offer to give it back for some portion of it. And for most people who don't have the benefit of free legal representation from an organization like the Institute for Justice, it's simply not practical for them to fight. So they end up giving up their money. That's right. They ended up giving up their money. Well, in a moment, we'll be back to talk more with Rob Johnson about an aspect of the Hirsch Brothers case that has far-reaching ramifications for all Americans. And I'll talk more with Rob and with Roger Pilon of the Cato Institute about the future of civil asset forfeiture and what's being done to control it. We'll be back after the break. Hey, folks, if you enjoy listening to podcasts like this, you know what you'd really love? Audiobooks. They're great entertainment for your morning commute or your workout while you're cleaning the house or just unwinding before bed. And right now, Audible.com has a special promotion for listeners of Kick-Ass Politics, a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial. So you can check out the over 180,000 titles offered by Audible. Just go to audibletrial.com backslash kickass politics or you can click on the link on our website at kickasspolitics.com to get your free audio book and if you like what we're doing here at kickass politics and you want to help keep us on the air then please show your support for the show and make a donation by going to our gofundme campaign at gofundme.com backslash kickass politics that's g-o-f-u-n-d-m-e dot com backslash kickass politics or go to the show website and click on the donate link. Your support will help keep us producing new and even more interesting programs in the future. That's gofundme.com backslash kickasspolitics. I appreciate your encouragement and support. Welcome back. In the first part of the show, Rob Johnson of the Institute for Justice talked about the case of the Hirsch brothers in Long Island, who had $446,000 taken from their bank account under U.S. civil asset forfeiture laws. Their case drug on from 2012 until late January of this year, when the Justice Department suddenly and mysteriously dropped the structuring case and returned the Hirsch brothers' money. Now, I suppose it's always possible that the feds just suddenly decided to grow a heart and do the right thing, but once I started connecting the dots, I realized that the sudden dropping of the case against the Hirsch brothers probably had way more to do with politics than with altruism. You see, the person in charge of prosecuting the Hirsch brothers' case was the U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of New York, Loretta E. Lynch. Now, if that name sounds familiar, you might recognize it because she is currently President Obama's nominee to replace Eric Holder as U.S. Attorney General. After two and a half years, the structuring case against the Hirsch brothers was suddenly dropped in late January, just weeks after Obama announced Lynch's nomination. You'll forgive my cynicism, 
but it reeks of a nominee frantically rushing to clean up her record ahead of what's expected to be a difficult Senate hearing. I asked Rob Johnson of the Institute for Justice if my theory was so far-fetched. Here's what he said. I, I think that may have had something to do with it as well. Uh, um, you know, I think that it's certainly possible that Lynch's confirmation hearing was part of the calculation in the Hirsch brothers' case. It's always a concern when officials in the government ignore the problems with civil forfeiture. And I think statements that Loretta Lynch made at her confirmation hearing, many of them were very distressing. I think she called civil forfeiture a wonderful tool. I would say a wonderful tool to do what? Well, let's look at the record of the woman that the Wall Street Journal has branded, quote, an enthusiastic grabber of private assets. During her tenure as the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York, Loretta Lynch has turned civil asset forfeiture cases into a cash cow for her department. Just between 2011 and 2013, Lynch's office pursued 123 civil asset forfeiture cases, seizing a total of $113 million in money and assets. And that's just for the Eastern District of New York. But as Roger Pilon of the Cato Institute points out, it could come back to haunt Loretta Lynch. That's one of the main reasons, not the only reason, but one of the main reasons that her confirmation is sitting there, or her nomination is sitting there. She has yet to be confirmed. And uh, um, this is something that um, now Holder did say that uh, he's interested in further reforms. Indeed, in January, Eric Holder ended the Justice Department's policy of so-called adoption cases, in which local law enforcement can circumvent their own state laws and team up directly with federal agencies to seize assets. As Roger points out, Holder's decision is progress, but very limited progress. This uh, has been uh, addressed just recently by Attorney General Eric Holder, but it is a very small part of the overall forfeiture picture, this kind of uh, go around the adoption uh, by the federal government of state forfeiture actions. And in fact, it doesn't even apply to joint federal state operations. So uh, this reform is just uh, a small part of the reform that needs to be done in this area of the law. And the fact is, Attorney General Holder's directive on forfeiture adoptions is merely a change in department policy. It's not an actual law, which means it's basically non-binding, and it's enforced entirely at the discretion of the sitting attorney general. At any point, Holder or any subsequent attorney general can simply decide to reverse this department policy. And given her record, I wouldn't count on Loretta Lynch to come to the rescue of forfeiture victims, which means as of right now, Americans have no real protections at the federal level to safeguard them against abusive forfeiture claims. But... There's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. In January 2015, Senator Rand Paul and Congressman Tim Wahlberg introduced legislation to radically reform civil asset forfeiture laws. It's called the FAIR Act. That stands for First Amendment Integrity and Restoration Act. Among other things, it would permanently abolish federal forfeiture adoptions, and it would order that all seized assets go into the general fund instead of individual departments' funds, to eliminate the so-called policing-for-profit incentive. It would also raise the standard of proof in seizure cases from probable cause to a preponderance of evidence. And in structuring cases like Terry Deco's, the feds would have to prove that the bank account holder knowingly tried to avoid reporting to the IRS. And it would also require a hearing within 14 days of the seizure. I asked Roger Pilon of the Cato Institute if the FAIR Act goes far enough to protect Americans from forfeiture abuse. Oh, yes, it it moves very much in the right direction, but there is more that needs to be. It doesn't get rid of the facilitation doctrine, for example. That is the core of the matter, matter, the idea that the, quote, property is guilty. That that has to go. And I'm not as clear that that does in this act. So far as I know, it doesn't. But there, I can recommend several reforms. First of all, all of this should be a function of the criminal law, not the civil law, uh, except in very rare cases. In other words, if you're going to seize a person's property, you've got to have a reason to do it. And if it's criminal asset forfeiture, then he's got to be proven guilty of a crime. And um, 
uh, the, any assets he has uh, should be available to him to defend himself. Because otherwise, if they seize all his assets, he's got nothing left to defend himself. And Rogers says it's time for citizens to start putting pressure on their representatives to pass this and other legislation to put an end to civil forfeiture abuse once and for all. Basically, they've got to bring this, uh, these complaints to the uh, legislatures, federal and state. And in fact, most of the abuses take place at the state level. And uh, interestingly, this is one of the areas where you might be able to see Republicans and Democrats working together in the Congress, because these abuses just cry out for correction. It's time to call your congressmen and your senators and demand real reform. Law enforcement is getting more and more brazen with forfeiture laws. It happens every day to innocent, law-abiding Americans. And sooner or later, you or someone you know could be targeted unless you take action and light a fire under the politicians in Washington. Now, if you've been a victim of civil asset forfeiture at the local, state, or federal level, there is help available. The Institute for Justice has lawyers just like Rob Johnson to represent forfeiture victims for free. Just go to their website at ij.org and they have a form to report abuse. Fill it out and they just might be able to defend your case for free. It is a little hard to find the form on there, so I'll include a link in the show notes on our site at kickasspolitics.com. And if you want to find out more about civil asset forfeiture, I'd suggest visiting the Cato Institute's site at cato.org. That's C-A-T-O dot org. My thanks to Rob Johnson of the Institute for Justice and Roger Pilon of the Cato Institute for joining me, and a special thank you to Terry Deco for coming on the show. If you missed part one on civil asset forfeiture, then you should definitely go back and listen to that as well. Now, before I forget, Mother's Day is coming up. It's coming up on May 10th. And if you want to send flowers that really have that wow factor, then our new sponsor, Flower Advisor, is your new best friend. Let me tell you, folks, they've got orchids, tulips, daisies, sunflowers. They've got roses in a dozen different colors. Whatever mom's favorite flower is, you can bet they've got you covered over at Flower Advisor. And if for some reason mom doesn't like flowers, they have a variety of fun themed gift baskets like their tea time basket with a variety of English teas and cookies or send mom their Godiva chocolate tower with 11 different boxes of Godiva chocolate treats. You can also send her one of their delicious cheesecakes. But hey, if all else fails, send her what she really wants. A bottle of whiskey or wine or vodka or even a bottle of Dom Perignon. That's right, Flower Advisor will even send mom booze on Mother's Day. Because face it, what greater gift can you give your mother than something to make dad a little bit more bearable for just a few hours? And right now, you, the listeners of Kick-Ass Politics, can get 10% off for Mother's Day by going to kickasspolitics.com and clicking on the special offer from Flower Advisor on our sponsor page. So you've got no excuses now. So go! Do it now, because if you don't, you're going to forget. Don't break mom's heart and live a life of regret. Just go to kickasspolitics.com and click on the special offer for our listeners. That's 10% off for listeners from Flower Advisor. Now be sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes and leave us a review for a chance to win my book of the week. And if you like the show, then consider making a donation on our website or go to our fundraising campaign at gofundme.com backslash kickasspolitics. Your support will keep the lights on around here and keep us producing new shows with more interesting guests. And speaking of that, in the next episode, I'll be joined in studio by Grover Norquist, founder of Americans for Tax Reform. And he has a new book in which he says it's time to end the IRS entirely, once and for all. Benito. And he's coming on the show to explain exactly how we can make that happen. That's in the next podcast. But for now... I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kick-Ass Politics. Gas Politics is a trademark of Mathis Entertainment, Inc.